Hey, how's it going? It's uh, Saturday around noon as I'm recording this. On Thursday night, um, you know, I uh, crashed my motorcycle. Um, I took a turn and I slipped on some gravel and just spun out. The rear wheel went right out from under me and I banged up my knee pretty badly. I don't think it's broken, um, but uh, it's really banged up. And um, insofar as my, my wrist, my right wrist, I, I broke something in it, I'm pretty sure. And I think I broke a rib. Actually, I know I broke a, a rib, you know. And so it's, um, <laughs> it's been an exciting time here. <laughs> so anyway, uh, what I wanted to talk to you about is something completely different, not motorcycle accidents. But I wanted to talk to you about um, how this conflict in Ukraine, was an existential war for Russia at the start of it. But it wasn't an existential crisis for the West, for the United States and Europe, but it has become an existential crisis for the West and they have lost. If this was a war, the West has lost already. And let me explain why. Well, see, at the beginning of this conflict, you know, the Russians, whether you agree with them or not, it doesn't really matter. The Russians thought that uh, Ukraine joining NATO was potentially an, exist an existential crisis for them. They could not have NATO troops on their border. They could ha not have NATO nuclear weapons positioned in Ukraine. And so that's why they invaded. Mm -hmm. That's their justification to themselves of why they invaded. Whether you believe this or not is irrelevant. It's what they believe. They viewed it as an existential crisis. But for the West, it was not existential. After all, what does the West care about Ukraine? Ukraine, in the, in the Western scheme of things, is trivial. It, it's inconsequential. And so, at the start of the conflict, it was not an existential crisis for the West, but it became one. It is one now because of the following reason. You see, when the West imposed all of its sanctions, right, the, the, what was the goal? It was to destroy the Russian economy. I mean, it was a declaration of war in everything but name. And so they imposed all of these sanctions, radical sanctions, and including some key measures the, the, the unplugging of Russian banking system from SWIFT and the, uh, ex, uh, the removal of their access to uh, MasterCard and Visa, okay, and a, and a whole host of other economic measures. And these economic measures were designed to break the Russian economy. Mm -hmm. And the idea was it'll break the Russian economy and this will usher in regime change. By the way, this approach to economic sanctions has never removed a government that the West didn't like. It didn't happen in Cuba, it didn't happen in uh, Iran, it didn't happen in uh, Venezuela. You know, I mean, it, it's just stupid, but okay. They went ahead with this. But the thing is, see, unlike with Iran or Cuba or Venezuela, the Western economies did not depend on the target of the sanctions like they do with Russia. Because the European economy has been premised on two pillars. Number one, cheap access to consumer goods from China, and number two, cheap energy from Russia. And so by imposing these sanctions, the European economies cut themselves off from that cheap European, uh, that cheap Russian energy. And what has happened to the European economy? Well, it's radically deindustrializing. It's been a catastrophe for the European economies. Inflation is through the roof and it's, there's no stopping it. It's just gonna keep on galloping away. And so for the Europeans, I mean, this killed their economy. It really did. Now, for the Americans, it was more subtle. And it had a lot to do with how the Russians played the diplomatic and political game with the rest of the world. Because you see, the Russians, you know, everybody says that the war has been so slow, so slow going, but the Russians have never viewed the war as the only way to achieve their political goals. They understand that a lot of times warfare is just a continuation and extension of political and diplomatic efforts. And so one could argue, as I'm coming to believe, that the Russians deliberately trying to go slow going 
because they needed the time to get the rest of the world on side, which they accomplished. You see, it's not just that the Russians were able to find other customers for their energy resources. They weren't able, it's not only that they were able to find other, other suppliers for vital um, equipment and technology and what have you that Russia needs. No, what happened was that the Russians showed the rest of the world, today me, tomorrow you. And so a lot of the other countries around the world started realizing, you know, the Americans are capricious. And if they don't like what we're doing for whatever reason, no matter how silly or arbitrary, they'll turn, us on, turn on us on a dime and they'll cut us off and they'll try to break our economies like they tried to break the Russians' economy. And so what has this led? Well, of course, the Russians have been pushing this along, but at the same time, it was an organic development of the other countries that they realized, hey, we have to pivot away from the United States. We have to de-dollarize. We have to start... Uh, uh, trading with other countries and trading with other countries in other currencies besides the dollar. And we have to sell our products, our resources, our what have you, in currencies other than the dollar. Because if we take dollars, we're going to be under the thumb of the American financial system. And they might decide to sanction us like they did Russia and break our economy. And it didn't work with the Russians, but it might happened to us. So we're going to de-dollarize. And that's why so many countries have all of a sudden started pivoting towards China. India is the biggest example. India all of a sudden has pivoted decisively towards Russia and to a lesser extent to China because of this fear, this fear that the Americans will target them. Saudi Arabia, they're starting to talk about selling their oil in other currencies aside from the dollar. Now, why would this matter to the Americans? Very simple. The U.S. economy is a deficit economy. It has a negative balance of trade. It has a budget deficit perennially, year after year. It's what, 32 trillion? And that's just federal debt. We're not talking about agency debt and uh, state debt, let alone municipal debt. The United States depends on the rest of the world taking its dollars that it has acquired by way of trade and putting those dollars into the American capital markets, specifically treasury bonds, but all the capital markets generally. And so what has happened is that as these other countries de-dollarize, their surpluses aren't going to go into the treasury bond market. They're going to go elsewhere. And so the United States is going to find it increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to finance its debt. And since the American economy, since at least the late 80s, has been financed by debt and cannot survive without debt, without somebody willing to take its treasury paper, well, then the American economy is going to start to suffer and eventually collapse because the only way that the United States will be able to finance itself is by printing. Of course, they're not going to call it, you know, printing money. They're going to come up with all kinds of sophisticated stuff. Originally, they called it quantitative easing. Remember that? And they'll come up with other clever titles for it, other clever names. But it's basically the same thing. See, the U.S. government will issue debt and the Federal Reserve will print the money, conjure it out of thin air to buy that debt. And what will happen? Inflation will rise. We're already seeing it. Hmm? And so now the war in Ukraine has become existential for the Russians, but it has also become existential for the West, for the Europeans and the Americans. But here's the caveat. See, it matters to the Russians if they win in Ukraine, because if they lose, the existential crisis will remain. But see, for the West, if they win in Ukraine, it's not going to change the outcome for them. See, because, see, if somehow, by some magic, the Zelensky regime were able to recapture all the territory that it lost since February 24th, and recapture Crimea even, that is not going to change the fact that the West no longer has access to cheap energy from Russia. And that's not going to change the fact that the rest of the world no longer trusts the United States 
And so the rest of the world is going to continue to de-dollarize. The Europeans are going to no longer have access to any of the Russian resources. And so in a very real sense, the war has been lost already by the West. They started this conflict as, you know, this minor thing happening in Far Eastern Europe, but because of their own measures, they destroyed themselves and they can't fix it. There is no way that the Russo-European relationship will go to a status quo antebellum if the war suddenly magically ended now. Why? Because the Russians no longer trust the Europeans. Because the Europeans, specifically Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, have given interviews saying that the Minsk II agreements, they were just a way to buy time. The Minsk II agreements, which were supposed to ensure peace, approved by the United Nations Security Council, and all the stamps and all the signatures and all the rest of it, it's not worth the paper it was printed on. And so all of a sudden the Russians realize we can't do business with them and we have other customers. So no matter what happens in the conflict in Ukraine, the West has lost already. I mean, even if they start sending, you know, 100,000 troops here to Ukraine, you know, magically, which they can't do, but suppose. So what? So what? They recapture, you know, the, the occupied territories in Crimea, and what? The Russians are going to keep on going. They've got a million-man army, bigger, than with all the call-ups and whatnot, and they go with even more troops, more call-ups. If NATO actually put 100,000 troops, boots on the ground in Ukraine, which is not going to happen. As a practical matter, it's not going to happen. Forget about the political issue. Mm -hmm. And so the West has lost already, and it is now an existential crisis for the West. But the political leadership in the West thinks that if they win in Ukraine, everything will go back to normal. They don't understand the changing reality. You see? And so they're going to keep on putting more weapons into Ukraine, causing countless loss of life and destruction needlessly, thinking that if they just put in more weapons, you know, more HIMARS, more tanks, more F-16s, and then F-35s even, that somehow magically it'll go back to the way it was before. It doesn't work that way. See, once it goes, it goes. And it's gone for Europe and America. I mean, this is a tragedy because it's the West that did it to itself. And there is no way to victory. Not now, because for the West, the war is lost. Understand what's going on. 